This is the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. The neurohacking show where we teach you how to optimize your cognition. Keep up to date at roscoeswetsuitneuro.com. Now here's your host, Toby Passman. All right. We have a special guest on the show with us today, Dr. Christopher Estes. Dr. Estes is a dedicated and compassionate physician whose career has evolved from extensive experience with medically complicated patients. He became frustrated seeing people get passed from one specialist to the next without ever addressing the source cause of their medical problems. His practice at Miami Beach Comprehensive Wellness Center involves an integrated array of therapies for women and men, including functional medicine evaluations, intravenous and ozone therapies, platelet-rich plasma and stem cell therapies, and bioenergetic feedback. His specialties include management of mold, Lyme, and other environmentally acquired illnesses, gastrointestinal issues and dysbiosis, autoimmune diseases, natural approaches to fertility, hormonal management, and comprehensive detoxification programs. So Dr. Estes, super excited to have you on the show today. I am super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to hear a little about kind of your your introduction to functional medicine. Um, How did you, did you, so it sounds like you originally kind of were a kind of traditional Western medical doctor what was the transition like into getting into some of these more alternative uh, therapies? So, you know, it, it was a combination of um, professional and personal experiences. Um, you know, during my professional career, I spent my time in tertiary care settings. So, I mean, I was on faculty at the University of Miami. I did all my training there. Plus, I was at Columbia University for a couple of years in my fellowship, where I also did my master's in epidemiology. So I was used to being inside of these settings where we got all the referrals. So it was like, you know, complicated patients, you know, multiple medical issues, et cetera. And, um, you know, we had all the best specialists, you know, wherever we were. Okay. So I had, you know, a specialist in this, I had a specialist in that. And, you know, if you had any complaint, you know, no problem. We've got somebody that does that. And what I saw happening with a lot of these patients was that they would go from specialist A to B to C to D. Um, and, you know, they might acquire more diagnoses along the way, but they never really didn't seem to get much better. They, and I, since I was, I'm an OBGYN by training, that's my, I'm, st- I'm a board certified OBGYN. I also was a bit of, a, you know, the quarterback. I was a, you know, we did a lot of primary, I do a lot of primary care work where, you know, women would come to me as their primary physician. And so, you know, they would go on the medical merry-go-round, they'd come back to me and, you know, they'd still have their same complaint. <laughs> It's like, well, I sent you to the gastroenterologist, but my, you know, my GI tract isn't any better. They thought, you know, oh, maybe it was something in my bladder. The urologist thought I was, it wasn't in my bladder. So then they sent to the, me to the psychiatrist because they thought I was crazy. And now here I am back with you because, you know, it's, I'm not getting any better. Maybe it's my hormones. So um, I realized that, you know, this, this compartmentalized approach to medicine was really not serving patients very well. Um, and I started to explore more about, well, what's underlying people's issues. And one of the things I kind of got to be known for at the university, in addition to being, you know, doing a lot of complex surgery, I did a lot of, a lot of, uh, of surgery and other, and and advanced family planning procedures and stuff like that. I also was, did a lot of office gynecology where I worked on a lot of, uh, you know, chronic vaginitis. It's kind of a funny thing to be known for, but it's like, you know, people had, vaginitis that just wouldn't quit, you know, they got referred to me and I figured out ways to help women with chronic vaginitis, which is, you know, this can be a major problem, you know, it really disrupts people's lives. And I kind of look back at it and I realized when I was treating patients with chronic vaginitis, what I was actually treating was their gut. I was treating underlying GI problems. And if I made your GI tract work better, the vaginitis went away. So it wasn't really like, a, a vaginal problem. It was a, it was a dysbiosis problem. It was an imbalance to flora. It was, you know, fungal colonization in the gut and, you know, using approaches that treated that, um, I realized, you know, I was curing gynecologic problems. Um, and, you know, one of the first things you learn in when you're training in functional medicine is, you know, when in doubt, treat the gut. It's like, you know, if you, if you, if you're not sure where to start, you know, start with some GI repair because chances are that's going to help something you know, and it's the basis of where everything started. We also had our own, our own problems. Like, you know, I had a lot of fatigue. 
you know, brain fog, uh, you know, trouble with sleep. I was very overweight. Um, you know, my wife got very ill. My wife had uh, metastatic thyroid cancer. Uh, she also had, you know, severe problems with uh, headaches and uh, all sorts of body aches and strange things. And she went to, you know, all these different di- oh, Crohn's, I'm sorry too, she had Crohn's as well. And so we started, you know, she was on the same medical merry-go-round not getting any better. We did a lot of our own investigating to start figuring things out like, hey, you know, we got a bunch of food allergies here and sensitivities. We changed our diet. Hey, did you know that you're deficient in all these vitamins too? If you, you know, take these, you replace what you're deficient and you get better. And then we realized that we had a mold problem, like in two places, you know, back to back and mycotoxins came into play. And then we realized too, that my, my wife had Lyme, um, you know, uh, multiple species of co-infections as well, Babesia and Bartonella on top of Borrelia. And um, realized you look back at like, you know, 20 plus years of medical history and realize that it, it had been around for a very long time. So, um, you know, we got trained in it and this is all stuff we had to seek out ourselves, you know, through, um, you know, we started Institute for Functional Medicine, which is a great place to go. A lot of great docs there, a lot of great teachers. So learned a lot about the basics of functional medicine and physiology and nutrition. And we did training with people like Richard Horowitz and you know Joe Boroscano for Lyme and co-infections. Did training with, I'm still in mentorship groups with Neil Nathan, who you're probably familiar with. You know, uh, Dr. Nathan is very well known for his work in mold toxicity, mold illness, and environmentally acquired illnesses. I did Dr. Shoemaker's training too. Um, you know, so I learned from, from him as well. And then, you know, started and that really just got the ball rolling where it's like, okay, now once we know about all these things, like, what do we treat them with? Like, okay, pills don't always work. You know, my wife is a, is an acupuncturist and herbal medicine specialist. She's also an MD, um, but she wised up early and went back to school and got her master's in Chinese medicine and acupuncture. She, she realized that the conventional medical system wasn't working when she was in residency. And she's like, forget this. I'm going to go back and find a better way. So we had already been doing acupuncture and herbal medicine, but we realized that, you know, we got to branch out and do more. So things like, you know, all the IV nutritional therapies, ozone therapies, um, you know, using PRP for joint rehabilitation and all sorts of other things. Uh, And then, you know, really just taking a whole different approach to the way that you evaluated underlying medical problems. Um, So that's, that's kind of where we've wound up today. Um, and then we've even taken it to the next level where it's like, you know, we realized too that all of these issues that people develop over time, you know, also have significant, you know, psycho spiritual components to them as well. You know, so there's the psychological stressors, there's, you know, levels of spiritual development, there's, you know, traumas that people have in life. A lot of people, we like to call it medical trauma because they've, they're sick, they don't feel well. They're going through the ringer at the hospital, you know, from place to place to place to place. You know, I don't know if you've ever had to go through a major workup or have a procedure in a hospital, but, you know, it's a very unpleasant experience. Like, not just the fact that, well, I had to have, you know, a surgery, but like, you know, from the beginning to the end, it's, it's often very unpleasant for people. Um, and dealing with and unwinding that kind of trauma um, is, a, is a key to healing and wellness. So we started learning more about, you know, things like acutonics, which is a a system of sound healing that we use. Um, It works on uh, planetary archetypes, um, legend and myth, as well as, you know, actual physical frequencies that we use um, on Chinese acupuncture points. Okay, so we use kind of like the principles of Chinese medicine combined um, with archetype in order to activate healing. And it works on a very deep level Um, more than just the physical. So, you know, we also encourage people to really look at those psychological stressors and figuring, help them figure out ways to address those traumas, you know, whether it's through, you know, counseling and therapy, um, their own spirituality and growth, meditation practices, hypnotherapy. Oh man, hypnotherapy is incredible um, to help with this, you know, and there's varying different types of that or EMDR. I'm sure you probably had folks on here that talk about EMDR. Um, that's another one that, that I have availed, I've availed myself of EMDR and found it very useful. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question or if I was kind of rambling there. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there. So as far as like 
for for the listeners so with toxic mold and lime you know i know those are those are big things that are plaguing i don't know maybe not just this country but the whole world it sounds like and but a lot of people don't know that they even exist let alone that they might actually be dealing with those can you talk to me a little can you kind of just introduce both both sure. toxic mold and lime and then also talk about kind of some of the the commonalities how they often show up very similarly uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it is an epidemic. Um, uh, the number of Lyme cases that is actually diagnosed, you know, that it's announced by the CDC is, uh, is known to be an underestimate. And it also doesn't take into account all of the other co-infections that may come along with Lyme. So just for definition's sake, you know, we'll say Lyme is Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay. That is true Lyme disease. However, there are multiple species of Borrelia which cause basically the identical problems as Borrelia burgdorferi. So there's species like Borrelia afzeli, Borrelia miyamotoi, you know, all these other spilmanii. There's all the other subspecies that they fall in a category called tick-borne relapsing fever. And then there's things like Babesia, uh, Bartonella, um, the Rickettsias, Ehrlichia, Anaplasma. Anyway, these, they, their symptomatology may be subtly different um, but they're often present at the same time as Lyme disease, oftentimes making the symptoms of Lyme worse. And for the purposes of what we're going to talk about today, when I say Lyme, I'm going to use that to refer to that entire category, even though that's not medically correct. So if anyone replays this podcast and says, SD says, no, he's talking about that's not Lyme, that's Borelli, that's, that's Bartonella. It's like, okay, I know, I know. I'm just going to say Lyme just because it's easier. Um, and, you know, I find that one of the most fascinating statistics I find about Lyme is that about half of people who are diagnosed with some form of chronic Lyme disease don't even remember getting bit by a tick. I mean, that's, that's just crazy, right? I mean, like the classic idea is that, okay, I got bit by a tick. I had this big old bullseye rash here and I got super sick and, you know, I was camping in the woods in, in, you know, in Connecticut and that's where I got it. But the fact of the matter is you can, you can acquire these infections in all 50 states, like they're present everywhere, okay? They're also present in other parts of the world, um, particularly Europe, actually, there's a lot in Europe and also in Asia. Um, and a lot of people don't remember getting sick or the illness that they had at the time was relatively mild. Although people often remember a turning point where they were like, you know, I was well until there was a summer or there was this trip and I came back. And after that, you know, I had, Oftentimes it's a strange illness. Oftentimes they'll give a history of having seen a couple of people, a couple of doctors along the way, and no one figured out what was wrong. Um, and it's, it often goes completely undiagnosed. So, you know, and mycotoxins and mold related issues behave in a similar fashion. Um, people often don't realize they're being exposed to it. Um, you know, the classic idea of, of being exposed to toxic mold is that you walk into this old rickety building that's got pipes leaking all over the place and there's this gross black stuff growing up the walls and like you know it smells like a wet mop and you know there's rats and cockroaches scurrying across the floor right and like oh yeah that's a bad building right uh, fact of the matter is you, you do not need to be in an old rickety building to be exposed to mycotoxins as a matter of fact, I, I've had plenty of patients in my practice that come, that live in very, very nice buildings that are not old and get exposed to mold and toxic mold. Um, myco mold and toxic, toxin producing mold can grow in as quickly as 48 hours. 48 hours, two days. So like if you get water damage in drywall or other parts of a building, if there are tox mold pro uh, toxin producing molds present, which then the thing is they're these days they're 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 quite ubiquitous in our environment. They're around all over the place. Um, you know, you can start the mold can start to grow within two days. Um, so you know, you don't need to have I mean, I've had stories of people who moved into a brand new apartment. They're the first people that live there and the place is growing mold. Um, when it comes to symptoms and suspecting it, it really runs the gamut. Like it, 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 you know, Lyme and mold affect every system of the body, every system of the body. Both of them are inflammatory. Um, they both, you know, activate the inflammatory systems and the immune system of the body in an abnormal way. 
Um, and when you look at, you know, the typical symptoms of Lyme and mold, a lot of them like overlap. If you know the Venn diagrams, you know, so like here's Lyme, here's mold. Okay, here's Lyme and mold. They're like this, like they're very, very similar. Um, classic symptoms of Lyme especially are things like migratory joint and muscle pains. That's like the, the real kind of classic red flag for Lyme. So Lyme and related infections, that is. So like, you know, today my shoulder hurts, tomorrow my, my, my other wrist hurts, then my knee hurts. Same thing, muscle pains. Um, may affect the GI tract, so unusual GI symptoms. Um, cognitive symptoms, another big one, you know, brain fog, difficulty concentrating, headaches, 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 refractory headaches, you know, nothing seems to work for my headaches or people will be diagnosed with migraine I've had migraine for years, can't figure it out. Um, stiff necks, another one. Stiff neck, that's another kind of classic one because a lot of patients with Lyme actually have a bit of a low grade chronic meningitis. So their neck is always a little bit stiff. Um, try to think if there's anything more particular to Lyme. I'm sure there is, but I'm kind of blanking on it right now. But mold, on the other hand, um, you know, also leans towards the fatigue side. So people with severe fatigue, tiredness, it often looks like allergies, like it sounds like allergies. So a lot of nasal sinus things, um, congestion, uh, cough, shortness of breath, because um, obviously one of the primary points of entry for mycotoxins is, um, and when I say mycotoxin, that means toxin from mold. Mycotoxins is through the respiratory tract, right? And the, the molds can also colonize your sinuses and your respiratory tract. So that's often part of the reason why these are so affected. Um, also GI symptoms. Uh, another classic one with, with mold and mycotoxins is weird weight loss or weight gain. So people who are losing weight for no apparent reason or people who are gaining weight for no apparent reason and can't seem to take it off. A lot of mycotoxins are also um, endocrine disruptors. So they affect your hormones. So any kind of hormonal imbalance patterns, particularly, you know, um, uh, sexual and erectile problems in men, as well as, you know, menstrual problems for women. Um, and, uh, you know, like also, again, back to, to the cognitive stuff, the brain fog. That's the classic, man. Like they can't, people can't think straight. And a good historical thing to talk about patients with mold is that symptoms may get worse and better depending on the environment they're in. So like I'm home. I feel terrible. I went and I visited, you know, my cousin in North Carolina for two weeks and I felt great. I was so, it was good, you know, and I, and then I came back home and I felt like crap again. Um, maybe it was because they were, you know, hiking in the, in the woods of, uh, of North Carolina and they were getting some fresh air. Okay. I was away from work. That's what it is. It's, it's just because I wasn't stressing. Well, you know, or maybe it was because there's something in your house, right? Maybe it's because there's something in your house. So looking for that environment trigger um, is often helpful to say, okay, you know, like when you're in this particular environment. Also, the, the, the other thing that's a very classic kind of moldy symptom, if you will, is when patients are particularly sensitive to moldy smells. Like I smell mold before everybody else. I walk into a room, I smell mold. I say, you know, it smells funny in here. And everybody else looks at me like I'm crazy. Like I, I'm the only one who smells it. And then I start to feel bad. Like, you know, and that feel bad, maybe anything from a headache to, you know, dizziness to shortness of breath to what, you know, anything, uh, up, uh, upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, um, you know, because that's one thing that's a, a kind of a classic symptom because they're, they're, their immune systems are actually on high alert all the time because they're under attack by the toxins. So since they're under attack by the toxins, any small dose of the toxin basically, you know, sets their sets their uh, their alarm systems off. So they're very sensitive to it. Um, I often find too that uh, patients who have multiple chemical sensitivity um, are. Um, are actually one one of the underlying causes. Multiple chemical sensitivity is a whole. Uh, you know, that's a whole discussion in and of itself in a way, but I find that one of the very common underlying triggers for multiple chemical sensitivity is actually mycotoxins. Um, but there's a lot of overlap between Lyme and, and mold symptoms. Um, and also the, uh, uh, oftentimes patients are, are affected by both. Um, particularly like if a Lyme, a patient knows they have a Lyme, Lyme and or co-infections and they're not getting better even though you're treating the Lyme, 
Like, okay, we're treating Lyme, treating Lyme, treating Lyme, not better, not better, or I was better than I got worse. Check those patients for mycotoxins. Like oftentimes they have mycotoxin issues as well. Now, specifically related to the, the psychiatric or kind of cognitive symptoms, how many people do you think walking around who are going to a going to psychiatrists, going to, you know, wondering why they have such bad brain fog? How many, what percentage of those people do you think are affected by Lyme or mold? Oh man, <laughs> a lot. Uh, you know, I, I want to, I, my hope for the future is that one day we look back at what we today call psychiatry and realize that it's environmental toxicity. And I mean that, and I'm gonna say that in a broad blanket environmental way. It's the environment of toxins. It's the environment of infections. It's the environment of allergens. It's in the environment of psychosocial, spiritual, emotional stressors, okay? Like that, that's the, that's what psychiatry is. It is not an epidemic of serotonin deficiency. You know, that's, that's how it gets treated, right? It's like, what do you get? I'm depressed, but here's an SSRI, here's an SNRI, here's, you know, uh, all these, you know, drugs that are designed to manipulate your neurotransmitters. And now I'm also not completely poo-pooing that because they do help people, okay? So, and there are certainly roles for, for those drugs. So I would say like, if people need to be on them or they need to use them, uh, I don't have a, I, I don't discourage necessarily people from using them. However, I, I, I'd like to see them like a bridge, you know? So it's like, okay, I'm gonna need this, you know, antidepressant medication, anti-anxiety medication. Now that's another one I think we see even more of today is anxiety. People are super anxious and wound up. I mean, it's, it's, it's contagious too, you know, like if someone else in the room is anxious, everybody else becomes anxious. You can feel that connection, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely a substantial portion, you know, and pretty much almost anybody has something underlying their psychiatric issue, you know, whether that's the brain fog, fatigue, cognitive issues, um, you know, or depression, anxiety, poor sleep, you know, how much of it is Lyme and mold? I mean, that's, I, it's a little hard to guess, but everybody is going to have a little bit of something. Um, and Lyme and mold is always on the list. Um, it's just, we have to decide how to work that up depending upon the individual's history. And then in terms of, yeah, I mean, I was going to just say, as far as the, what you were talking about with, with like SSRIs and, and serotonin, you know, it seems like the whole role of chronic inflammation and, and neural inflammation in psychiatric or, or neurological conditions is, is so discounted by kind of the traditional medical community. I mean, cause it's like research labs know this. I mean, they, they've associated like C-reactive protein levels, a measure of inflammation, with depression, they've correlated that very well, but it's like, why, you know, why is, why are doctors not paying attention to that? It, it kind of confuses me. Uh, it's because there's no anti HSCRP pill. That's why, what do you do for an elevated HSCRP? What, well, you know, what, what's causing that HSCRP? Well, there's a list of things about this long, you know, that could potentially be doing it. And if you, if you don't understand how to do the workup, there's not a drug for it. So I think that's a lot of what we do in conventional medicine, you know, is based on the playbook you're taught. So you're taught to, you know, okay, well, first of all, you're taught like, okay, you know, this is your, this is your compartment. So <laughs> I'm a psychiatrist. This is my compartment. You know, I'm a cardiologist. This is my compartment. You know, I'm a, I'm an, I'm an OBGYN, you know, this, this lady's compartment over here is my compartment. I can't show that one on me, obviously. I'm just, I'm a very boring <laughs> cisgender straight dude, you know, so, anyway, so um, the, uh, the, so uh, that's one. And number two is like, you taught to then, okay, inside my box where I live, like I find an ICD-10 code, right? I find a diagnosis, right? And then corresponding to that ICD-10 code, I, I know that there's a list of laboratory things I can look at to then guide me over to the next step, which is going to be, you know, pill or maybe no pill at all, or, you know, procedure or surgery or something, 
right? So you, you get you do get a very very much like kind of like this little decision tree analysis approach, and that's what's called standard of care, you know, um, you know, like and like this is you know there's guidelines and there's you know and and doctors I unfortunately have been kind of trained to become very robotic in their thinking that way, and I don't say that that because I feel that they're poorly intentioned. I don't think that anyone in medicine is necessarily poorly intentioned. I think that they all want to help people, but they're not, we're, we, we are not trained to learn how to do this stuff. You have to go after this information yourself. And when you get into the real world of medicine and you're done with residency, you're done with fellowship, and now, you know, either you're in a busy academic practice, you know, and you've got a million other responsibilities or things you're trying to do, or you're out in private practice, which is like a whole other beast of stuff to do, you know, worry about like, you know, trying to keep your doors open and, you know, take care of your staff and your patients and, you know, blah, 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 you know, and you're also pressured in the side of the system that we're in that you've got, you know, at best, you've got 15, 20 minutes with this person. It's like, you know, I could spend, you know, a long weekend on, you know, in the Bahamas on Bimini with you. Have you ever been to Bimini? I haven't. It's beautiful. There's like nothing to do. <laughs> it's a beautiful well there's the casino and like stuff like that so if you want to go gamble and whatever but basically I mean, you know we could be on this desert this beautiful deserted island you know with nothing to do but you and me hang out by the pool and i could talk to you for like a long weekend and i still wouldn't know your whole life right i still wouldn't you still you know we wouldn't know each other's whole life because we only had three days right and your life is obviously much longer than three days how can i know someone's whole life in 15 minutes i can't right so you learn how to very quickly winnow down, you know, what you, what tool you have in your toolbox that's going to work on this person. And if it's not inside of your wheelhouse, then it's, you know, either not your problem or this person has a complaint that's not real or not, not valid, or at least not bad enough that it needs a medication. And you're just, you know, just pat you on the back and go, okay, you're all right. Don't worry. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Um, so I guess it's a very roundabout way of, of saying <laughs> that uh, the system that conventional medicine works inside doesn't have doesn't necessarily give the time to really dig into these issues to really understand like okay I need to talk to people about their home environment about their occupational environment about their past exposures about you know really dig into some of these other symptoms to raise and lower my suspicion about whether or not they have a chronic infection or they've been exposed to toxins or whatever and then you got to learn how to to actually do it. And because, when, like I said, the busyness of medicine and the busyness of physicians, um, you know, they may not have the time to really learn it. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of hours I spend, you know, learning more, learning more, learning more. I mean, I don't think anybody does as much CME as me and my wife. Well, no, that's not true. There's probably other people out there in functional medicine that do. But I mean, we're always in a class, always. I mean, like ev almost every week we're doing something or giving a class. I gave a class just last night. Actually, I had a webinar last night on heavy metal toxicity. Um, you know, so like we're always, you know, challenging ourselves to go that next step, do the next thing. Like what's the next thing? This is part of what got me out of the conventional medicine because I mean, I was an academic. I was, you know, I published research, I published book chapters, you know, I was, uh, I was a submission reviewer for numerous journals, you know, like I was doing the academic thing, right? And I would go to the conferences and, you know, at the conferences, you know, every, you know, everybody there knew me. I was on national boards and whatever, all that sort of stuff. And um, I got a little bored of it because it was like the same topics every year by the same presenters getting the same kind of message over and over and over again. So it's like, there's just kind of like this feedback loop that we get. And, um, you know, it, it, it's got to come from the individual physician to break out of that loop. It's kind of hard to do. Now, when it comes to the, the tools that you've acquired in your unique tool belt, you know, tell me about what some of these therapies, like you use intravenous and ozone therapies, platelet-rich plasma, sure. stem cells. Talk to me about uh, what those are and, and what you use them for. I love playing with veins, man. That's all there is to it. <laughs> 
<laughs> we love veins. Uh, it's funny, like I, um, you know, I was, a, uh, you know, like I said, I'm an OBGYN by training. I did lots of surgery. So I, I love procedures. So procedures to me, I'm like, okay, a little, any little procedure I can do on someone, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing them. And I, I've found them to be incredibly helpful. Um, and of those procedures you mentioned, um, top of the list is probably the ozone therapies, like um, you know, major autohemotherapy or MAH or blood ozonation is you know the common way we think about it. I do multi-pass treatments with uh, hyperbaric ozone. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do for people because the the effect of the treatment is so systemic. Like it works everywhere. I actually get to hold your blood in my hand and expose it to this beautiful ozone gas and oxygen inside of a, of a glass jar and then give it back to you. And, you know, it activates mitochondria. It, it, it improves mitochondrial health. And like, I'm not, you know, making this up. This, there's data on this, like this is science. Um, you know, it improves immune response. You know, it neutralizes inflammatory mediators. So, you know, when you look at root cause of, you know, especially neurological things like cognitive issues, you know, neurological decline, you know, cognitive decline and all that sort of stuff. I mean, it's mitochondrial dysfunction is at the center of it. I mean, that's, you know, if your mitochondria aren't working, you, your tissues don't heal properly. You don't move ox, you don't produce ATP. <laughs> you don't make the energy your cells need to work. So if I can do something that helps give that a bump, like, you know, it's gonna help all over the body. I think this is part of the reason why, you know, they're skeptics because they're like, well, how can you treat autoimmune disease and somebody with Lyme and somebody with, you know, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with Parkinson's or something, you know, how can you claim that all these sort of things are treated by one molecule? Um, and, you know, the response is that it's it's not a direct molecular treatment to a disease. It is a molecular treatment to your physiology. It's actually improving your mitochondrial health, among other things. Um, so that one is, to me, it's just like, it's kind of like the most bang for your buck. It's like, okay, this one is going to cover a lot of bases. And then oh, if you want to put... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say what you're talking about there. You're you're echoing back almost exactly what I heard Dr. Frank Schallenberger say on the podcast when when I had him on a couple of years ago, where he was talking exactly about, uh, you know, and he's one of the the leading anti aging physicians who I believe actually oh, yeah. brought ozone therapy to the United States, and he was talking exactly about how uh, mitochondria he believes are kind of the biggest. Uh, biggest factor in determining whether someone is going to be able to live a life of, of health and wellness or uh, disease and sickness and ozone being one of the most powerful stimulants of the mitochondria makes a lot of sense that it would work for a lot of different sort of conditions like you're saying. Sure does. So I, I had a moment at the beginning to mention some of my teachers. It's always important to us to, to recognize our lineage um that comes to us from our i mean it's good for everybody but you know we, we 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 lean towards chinese medicine in our energetic traditions and we do a lot of chinese medicine practices here you gotta have my wife on like you'll love she's a, she's really interesting she'll tell you a lot of cool stuff about energetics and um how we use chinese medicine and acupuncture to really address these sort of problems too but i, I i'll pay a moment to to say thank you to dr schallenberger as well because he was a he's a mentor to me as well as, as was Dr. Rowan, Robert, I don't know if you know Robert Rowan, he's another one of the, the kind of ozone gurus uh, here in the States. These guys have, you know, brought, brought ozone into, into the mainstream practice. And, you know, a lot of, most of what I've learned has been from folks like them and it, he, they're exactly right. And I mean, I see the results too, um, you know, it's, and, and it's such a great therapy. It's really kind of sad that it's not more readily available. Um, because, you know, it's just, it's just not part of mainstream medicine. Now, so, so we got ozone and then tell me about platelet, platelet rich uh, plasma. Cause that's one that I, I don't believe anyone has specifically addressed on the podcast. So tell me, tell me oh, about wow. what that is. Okay. So, well, PRP platelet rich plasma is, you know, a process where we draw out um, your blood from a vein. Uh, we then spin it down in a special tube and we separate out the platelets and the plasma from the red blood cells. So I use a process that separates out basically all of the red blood cells 
And then we're left with the plasma, which is the yellow liquid portion of your, of your blood, as well as the platelets, okay? Um, the plasma contains um, many different kinds of anti-inflammatory factors, and the platelets secrete a substance that's known as platelet-derived growth factor, PDGF, okay? So we reconstitute the platelets back into the serum by like a nice gentle rotation of the tube. There's a, oh, by the way, there's like dozens of systems out there for how people harvest your PRP. Um, you know, everyone has their preference and some will argue that this is so much better than that one. I have one that I've settled on, you know, it, it, and it does the job for what I, what I wanted to do. I've, I've had good results with it. Um, and we draw the, the, the platelets and the plasma back out of the, of the separation. And then we take that fluid, the platelets and the plasma, and we inject it wherever we wanna have an effect, okay? So it's particularly useful for joint and musculoskeletal problems, okay? So shoulder pain, elbow pain, knee pain, back pain, neck pain, wherever it hurts, we can inject it. Is what it's actually doing is two things. Number one, the anti-inflammatory factors that are in the plasma are going to actually help calm down the inflammation in the, in, the, in the local area. Number two, the platelets that are secreting that PDGF, that platelet-derived growth factor, are actually going to call in your body's own stem cells. Okay, so every person has stem cells in their body all the time. It's just how active are they? Okay, when we're little babies, like when we just came out of the womb, we got lots of stem cells and they're really bouncy and they're super active, right? That's why people get stuff out of, you know, uh, umbilical cords and placentas and, you know, whatever, and, or, the, or the, the own stem cells out of, you know, cord blood and stuff like that. So there's tons of them in there. The older we get, the lower the number of stem cells we have banging around is, okay? But you can wake them up, okay? And if you use things like platelet-derived growth factor, that wakes them up, okay? Um, you can do similar things, actually, with ozone injections. I don't know, if, did Dr. Schallenberger talk about doing ozone joint injections and stuff? He may have touched on that. Yeah, he that loved, I know he loves to do that too. Is that prolotherapy? Is prolotherapy, it it, prolozone, yeah. exactly, prolozone. So you can do prolozone as well. Um, you know, where you inject ozone gas and that actually just hyperoxygenates the tissues um, to, to stimulate healing. I, I usually do the PRP because I, I, I think it gives me a little bit better results. Um, and, you know, what you're doing is using your own juice to, to, to speed healing, okay? Um, other applications that we'll do for it are things like uh, hair rejuvenation. So people who are starting to lose their hair, like your, your hairline's going back a little bit, um, we inject it into the scalp and it does the same thing for the hair follicles. This is actually also very well. And all these things, by the way, I'm talking about, they're quite well researched. There's publications on the effectiveness of this. Um, and uh, we can actually help people like stop losing hair and even make hair you have look uh, become thicker and fall out less. It won't necessarily advance a hairline. So it's not like, you know, a, a hair transplant where if like you've got a total bald spot, your hair is not going to come back. But the hair that you have becomes thicker and it, it will stick nicer and it'll fill in and it slows hair loss down significantly. Um, we also do it on the face. Facial rejuvenation will help reduce fine lines and wrinkles. Um, you know, we do it either with microneedling or with direct injection. Um, and the other one is for erectile dysfunction, for ED. Um, you can you basically do a little anesthesia into the uh, dorsal nerve of the penis and then inject it right into the corpora cavernosa, which is the, the spongy part of the shaft of the penis. And um, it helps with erectile function. We also use it around um, uh, uh, the female uh, perineum as well, like helping with, uh, you know, uh, healing from like episiotomy scars. I've helped with that. Like it's really good to help with scar healing as well. Uh, vaginal rejuvenation actually too, as well. Cause it basically what it does is it takes the tissues that you have and it makes your tissues healthier. So wherever you need to make your tissues healthier, you can inject PRP and it helps, helps to rejuvenate them and, and make them work better. Now, another really interesting uh, type of therapy that, that we discussed a bit before we started airing is, is acutonics, which you told me about. I had never heard of that before. Can you tell me and uh, the listeners a bit about what that actually is and how you use it in your practice? Uh, yeah, uh, it's one of my favorite, another one of my favorite things to do. Maybe even, maybe even more favorite than ozone. Um, so acutonics is a system developed by a woman named Donna Carey. Um, and now she and, and her partner, Alan Franklin, uh, run the Acutonics Institute. So if anyone's interested, it's A-U-C-T-O-N-I-C-S, Acutonics. And you can go to 
uh, I believe their website's acutonics.com um, and check it out. And it is an entire system of sound healing that is based upon the principles of Chinese medicine combined with planetary archetypes. So we have a set of tuning forks and chimes and gongs that are based on planetary frequencies. So we have a fork for Mercury, we have a fork for Mars and Venus and the Earth uh, day rotation. We also have one for, for all the planets, okay? As well as some of the asteroids, okay? Because there's asteroids influences. And um, the way that the frequencies came about was based on the theory of the music of the spheres. Are you familiar with that? I am not, no. So, Way back when, you know, um, there's this idea that the planets, as they rotate around, now, of course, this was back in, way back in the day when we thought the planets were rotating around us, that, you know, that they actually made a noise, okay? So, like, they made a sound as they went by, okay? Um, and, you know, we couldn't detect that sound because, you know, it was always there, so we couldn't hear it. That was part of the theory. I'm not going to go too much into the history of, of uh, philosophical debate about this, but fast forward to the 1970s, and I'm really, I'm so sorry to do this, but I'm blanking on the name of the person who actually figured this out. I have to look it up, I'll send it to you later. <laughs> but some, a scientist actually calculated, okay, if we take the, you know, orbital speed of the planets and speed it up to a frequency that we can actually hear, you can actually determine what the frequency sound of each planet is okay so that then becomes the frequency of venus that becomes the frequency of um, jupiter etc it's based on their orbital speeds okay and we've done this for all these things and um in chinese medicine there's a concept of what we call ling um and ling basically has to do with the crystallization of the life's path from the spirit world coming down to the material it also invokes the idea of liminal space. So the space between spaces, the space between consciousness and unconsciousness, the space between physical matter and spiritual matter, or your, you know, your, your, your physical body and your spirit body. And part of the um, beauty of, of working in this space is that you can help people to make shifts in their perceptions and make shifts in you know their their spiritual path in ways that you know traditional treatments really don't address on top of that we use it to treat the physical symptoms so just like i can use acupuncture needles say oh my shoulder hurts no problem i've got you know tuning forks that i can use up here on those same acupuncture points that are going to help your shoulder or your back or your neck I've got a headache, I've got digestive problems, you know, these physical symptoms, we use the same principles with the forks to actually um, relieve those symptoms. But then there's other parts of the treatment that we'll do that actually help to access a deeper state of consciousness or an altered state of consciousness, if you will, for the individual receiving the treatment. Um, it's a lot like a, a guided meditation in a way. Um, what you experience. So um, everybody's experience is different. Um, some folks, you know, it's just a nice relaxing feeling. Other people feel like they almost fall asleep. Um, other people will, you know, see things like they see beautiful colors or they'll feel like, oh my goodness, I felt like I was like literally orbiting the earth or something like that. And, you know, it's usually these beautiful nice experiences, you know, and for folks who are, you know, particularly used to meditation or, you know, folks who used any entheogens, um, they'll often relate it to some of those entheogenic experiences too. Um, and um, I find that those sort of treatments um, are so, so wonderful for people. Like they really um, help to, you know, move things along in a different way than I am ever able to do by, you know, giving you a new bottle of supplements or like even ozonating your blood or, you know, giving you that vitamin IV. Like, I like all those things too. I think they're great, but this is working on a little bit of a, a little different level. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of an intro. And, and besides that, it's like, 
when I do it, um, when I'm actually practicing Akitanics, when I'm doing it, it's, um, it's, it's musical, right? There's sounds, there's tones. And when I'm actually doing the, when I'm selecting those frequencies, um, I'm using the archetype of those planets, of those astrological bodies to channel intention. So like, let's say I want to help you to, you know, balance out some inflammation in your body. Here's an easy one. So you want to have, you know, inflammation in some ways is a good thing, right? You need to like, you know, get rid of viruses and bacteria, and we need to, you know, inflammation is part of joint healing, but you don't want it to be too fiery. You don't want it to be too hot. You want to back it off a little bit. So we might use something like Mars, which is, you know, fiery and hot and associated with inflammation. But if I want to cool it off a little bit, who is the goddess that could calm Mars down? The only one who could reason with Mars was Venus. Venus. Yes, you know. Okay, good. You know your Greek myth. Excellent. It's all based, it's all like, you know, Greek and Roman myth is what it's based on. So that's part of the fun. It's like you get to relearn all your mythology, which I love. I, I find it. The stories of Greek myth are still so profound, like still to this day, like you can read those, those myths and you're like, wow, you know, like that's still a lesson. So I'm going to combine, you know, Venus and, Mer Venus and Mars. There we go. It's beautiful. Let's say I want to help you, um, improve the structure of your back, your spine, you know, it's, it's, you know, you got a little bit of a little kyphosis, you'll fold it in. I want you to be a little more straight, a little more, you know, uh, in line. Uh, we use Saturn. Okay. Saturn is about structure. It's about, um, you know, uh, things being in order, stuff like that. So we might use Saturn. Um, so like, as I'm choosing the forks and the combination of the forks in particular, it tells a story. It's like poetry. And as you do it, you know, I'm moving all over the place. It's like, there's a little bit of a, there's almost a little bit of a dance to it too. So it's like music and poetry and dance and an interaction with the client too, because as I do this, like I'm watching, how are they responding? Like I'm reading, you know, their breath. I'm reading, you know, like, you know, seeing how they feel and, you know, reading their energy really, you know, like to see how they're reacting to this. And, you know, that to me is like, it's like this, you know, it's the treatment, but it's also like this little um, solo performance, like an individual performance, you know, which is super fun. Yeah, super cool stuff that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. I've never, never heard of it. And you're the first person that's brought it up on the podcast. So very cool to hear about that. Um, Dr. Estes, we're, we're coming up onto the end of the show. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Um, and for the listeners who enjoyed the show, where can they find out more about your work or, or your practice? Sure, sure, sure. So we have a website. It's www.miamibeachcwc.com. That's CWC, like Comprehensive Wellness Center. The name of our practice is the Miami Beach Comprehensive Wellness Center. And if you go on our website under um, resources, there's a tab at the top that says resources. You can scroll down and there's a little thing that says professional education. If you click on professional education, that's going to take you to another page where they have, uh, where it's going to have all of our um, previously recorded webinars. So, you know, we're, we're really just starting to get into this. Um, I have major roots in teaching. Um, you know, I mean, I was in academics for years and like I was director of the clerkship and director of the, you know, undergraduate medical program in, in, in uh, um, reproductive endocrinology, you know, like the second, the second year course. So, I mean, I did a lot of stuff with, with giving lectures and things. I really miss it. So we're bringing that back, me and my wife too, Emily, um, who hopefully you guys will get to meet one day on this show. She would, I think she'd like to do it. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're building up a lecture series there. So we've already done a couple on, um, on mycotoxins and on heavy metals and, um, had a request last night to talk about um, diabetes and blood sugar. So maybe that'll be the next one. I don't know. <laughs> I would, if we're going to do anything about Lyme, though, that one, I think we're probably going to have to make a multi-part series. That one's tricky. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Well, yeah, for, but... for the listeners, I definitely recommend checking out those resources. And if you guys enjoyed the show today, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. We're about halfway to a thousand. So, so help us get to a thousand subscribers. And you can also connect with me on Instagram at Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you guys have any comments, questions, anything about the episode today, or any requests for future guests on the podcast, please feel free to reach out. 
Dr. Estes, I wanted to really thank you for uh, coming on the show today and sharing all of your knowledge and expertise. Thank you very much for having me.